The first memory I have of my father's voice is nonsense. It's my father saying, Oh, Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. Or rather, singing it, my father made up tunes for Bombadil's nonsense songs as, we, as he read me uh, snippets of Lord of the Rings when I was much too young to understand the whole of the story. He would read me uh, just bits of it that he thought I would enjoy as a little kid. And the, the adventure with Tom Bombadil was perfect for a kid uh, of a very young age. It's got just enough scariness to be fun, but, you know, it's still lighthearted. And so Tom Bombadil has been a uh, significant part of Lord of the Rings to me since my very first introduction to it, uh, listening to my father read to me uh, so many years ago. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Geek Pantheon. I am your host, Philip. Uh, this is another Middle, er Middle Earth lore video sponsored by the Geek Lyceum, a fan-made book club uh, started by uh, members of our Facebook group and our Patreon community. Uh, and I'm going to make this video at, largely at the request of our fan uh, and listener and wiki creator and all-around documenter, uh, Laura, uh, who wanted, wants to know why I think Tom Bombadil is not wasted space. Tom Bombadil is uh, a much debated character in Tolkien's Legendarium. Some people are just devoted to this idea that he's extremely important to the story, uh, while others see him as just sort of this kind of indulgent, in fact, entirely unrelated to me making this video, uh, the much more successful YouTuber Matt Colville uh, recently made a video on Bombadil in which he talked about his recently developed appreciation for Bombadil, uh, but still kind of views Bombadil as a bit of an indulgence and also argues that there's not really any point in looking for where Bombadil fits in Middle Earth. And I'm going to argue that that's not actually true, that there is, in fact, uh, plenty of reason uh, to examine where Bombadil fits in Middle Earth, even if we accept that we're never going to get a clear answer on it. Uh, so the question that we always come around to is, who is Tom Bombadil? Uh, this is asked twice in the book, once directly to him and once to his wife, Goldberry. Uh, and Tolkien, in, Tolkien intended this to be a mystery. Uh, I'm going to talk about why at the end of this video he left it as a mystery and he intended it to be a mystery. But even though Tolkien intended it to be a mystery, uh, that does not mean that it's pointless for us to ask. Because a lot of what we have in Lord of the Rings, in fact a lot of Tolkien's Legendarium, is a result of Tolkien seeing things on the edge of old stories and wondering what are they. And I'm going to give some examples of that later when I argue about why this is not a pointless question. So, we're going to approach this in a few different steps. We're going to first talk about where did Bombadil come from in the story. He just sort of appears uh, rather unexpectedly in the story. Uh, and where does, he, where does he come from? What's his external history? Then we're going to look at the actual question of Bombadil in the story. And then we're going to talk about what Bombadil does for the story and why it's worthwhile to examine him and, and ask questions about where he comes from and try to figure it out. Uh, now, importantly, what we're not going to do, and I'll explain why uh, as we look at it, but what we're not going to do is um, try to interpret what Bombadil means, what he represents outside. Um, Tolkien, in a letter to a friend uh, who had put a lot of thought into Bombadil, and I'll talk more about that letter later on, uh, says that Tom is not worth philosophizing about. That's not the same as not worth asking questions about, but it means that Tom is not you know, someone that, that that you gain anything from by asking deeply, what does he mean? Because it's not exactly important what Bombadil means. It's Tolkien describes Bombadil as a comment on something, and we'll kind of talk about what he's commenting on when we get there. So, we have a, um, a couple of interesting points here. One, Bombadil's external history. Uh, Bombadil's a toy owned by uh, one of Tolkien's children. It was a little Dutch doll uh, that had this outlandish outfit on it, yellow boots and a bright blue jacket and a big hat. 
uh, and Tolkien, uh, or possibly his children. It's not exactly clear who came up with the name, uh, which is significant when you consider Tolkien's love of names. But Tolkien or his children named the doll Tom Bombadil, and Tolkien used to make up adventures for the doll. So the initial poems, the adventures of Tom Bombadil, were things that Tolkien made up about this children's toy that was lying around the house. All right. Secondly, uh, I mentioned this in my introduction video for Middle Earth, uh, Tolkien's writing method was to just grab things that were kind of interesting, and if you play RPGs and are a dungeon master or a game master, you do this all the time. You just grab things out of a, any source that was kind of interesting, pull it into his book, stick it in there, and then later when he came back to another rewrite, because he rewrote over and over and over again, when he came back to another rewrite, he would try to cause it to make sense. Uh, for example, this is um, happens all over the place, including with much more important characters. Uh, for example, um, Tolkien knew early on that Gandalf hadn't shown up. Uh, in the in the Fellowship of the Ring, when Frodo's waiting around in the Shire for Gandalf to come back and guide him on his journey, Gandalf doesn't show up. Tolkien didn't initially know that Gandalf wasn't going to show up, but when he got to that point in the story and he wrote, and he just Gandalf didn't show up, and Tolkien didn't know why. And so as he was going forward, he was taking notes in the margin, and that we have, um, you can find uh, images of this page in his notes where he had just this long list of people that might have hindered Gandalf. It needed to be something big, because Gandalf, Tolkien was already starting to get the impression, was a more important and more powerful person than Tolkien initially intended. Um, but who was it? And he wrote down these names. He wrote down, for example, uh, Giant Treebeard. Uh, of course, Treebeard becomes uh, an int later on, but initially was possibly one of these giants that had imprisoned uh, Gandalf. And he writes down all these other people. And last name on the list is Saruman. Tolkien didn't know who Saruman was. Uh, he knew what the name meant. The name meant a cunning man. Uh, but Tolkien didn't know who Saruman was. And if Saruman was going to imprison Gandalf, he needed to be someone as powerful or more powerful than Gandalf. And so over time, that name just pulled out of, out of nowhere, slowly developed into the character of Saruman, who, of course, plays a massively important role uh, throughout Lord of the Rings. And so Tolkien did that all the time. He was constantly surprised, and if you've ever tried writing a novel or creating a world or anything like that, uh, you've experienced this as well, is Tolkien was constantly surprised by things that happened in his books. Tom Bombadil he knew already, uh, and his addition to the story was a little bit more deliberate, but it was just that Tolkien liked this character he'd made up and he put him in the story, and then later he worked about why. How does he make sense? So uh, Tolkien was always uh, focused on allowing things to develop on their own. He wasn't worried about Bombadil. Bombadil was not put in there with a deliberate plan. He was put in there and then Tolkien went back to try and make him make sense. Uh, so that's where he comes from. He's from these nonsense poems that Tolkien had written called The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which you can find published uh, that were largely just adventures of this toy that he made up for his children. And in them, Tom Bombadil goes on all sorts of crazy adventures, and he's uh, threatened by Barrow White, and he's threatened by the, he's almost captured by the badgers, and the river daughter Goldberry grabs him and drags him under the water. Uh, and in all of these cases, Bombadil just laughs it off, gets out of the, out of the mess, and goes home. So that's the external history, so let's turn to the internal history, which is much more interesting. Uh, the question, who is Tom Bombadil? Now this question is asked twice, and we're going to get to the answers that are given in the book here in a minute. But a couple of reminders, if you watched my last video, you talked a little bit about the worldview of Middle Earth, um, and this idea of love, this nurturing thing versus this versus lust, which seeks dominance and control and devours. We talked about the power of music, the world being created through music, and that's important because Bombadil sings constantly and solves all of his problems by singing. Okay? And then we also talked about the importance of nature and of being in, uh, in harmony with nature and of a love of nature. And Bombadil is an interesting case because Bombadil is, in many of his ventures, uh, opposed by natural things and yet is the master of them, but not in a domineering kind of way. So remember those things from the introduction video, and we can move forward. Okay, so Bombadil is asked 
twice. So let's look at the internal evidence for who Bombadil is. He's asked twice, or the question is asked twice. The first time, Frodo asks Goldberry, Tom's wife. Uh, we arrive in the house of Tom Bombadil after Tom rescues them from the willow, and Goldberry is making dinner, and Frodo says, uh, forgive me for asking if the question sounds foolish, but who is Tom Bombadil? And Goldberry says, he is. Now, this is important because one of Tolkien's uh, friends, who was a, a priest, uh, read that, and he put the emphasis as he is. Which, if you, like Tolkien, are a uh, know your Bible, you are going to get impressions of God saying to Moses, I am. And so Tolkien's friend had become convinced that Bombadil was some sort of stand-in for God. And Tolkien said, that's not what I mean. Surely, he's, he jokes, surely I can say he is about Winston Churchill just as easily as I can about Tom Bombadil. So Goldberry just says, he is, that guy over there. And then Frodo asks Tom later, as he begins to be aware of how old and knowledgeable Tom is, and Tom says, what, don't you know my name yet? I'm Tom Bombadil. That's the only answer there is. And then he turns the question around on Frodo and says, who are you, alone and nameless? And Frodo doesn't have an answer for that. And so Tolkien is making a comment with Bombadil a little bit on the importance of names, but he's also kind of telling us that he's just Tom Bombadil. Now, are, we're left with the question of, what does that mean? So, uh, let's look. Um, Bombadil has a bunch of names. The first thing we know about Bombadil is he's old, very old. He has a bunch of names. We're told at the Council of Elrond uh, that among the dwarves, Bombadil is known as Forn, which is the Old Norse word for ancient. And among the men of the north, he's known as Orold, uh, which is a word that just means very ancient. And among the elves, he's called Yarwin Benadar, which means oldest and fatherless. And when to uh, Frodo asks him, he says, eldest, that's what I am. And that is a very interesting answer because Tom then claims to have been around before the rivers and before the hills and before the trees and before the first acorn and before... Uh, the Dark Lord came from the outside, which is a very interesting phrase we'll talk about here in a second, uh, that Tom knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless. So, that is a very interesting answer to this question. And in fact, in early uh, drafts, if you look at Christopher Tolkien's outstanding history of Middle-earth uh, in the book The Return of the Shadow, um, Christopher Tolkien has... Uh, an early draft there in which Tom answers that he is an aborigine. Uh, now this just means an original inhabitant. So that's interesting. Um, Tom is here before anything. When the first elves came west, Tom was already there. First acorn, first all this stuff. Now, trees, Tom's here before the first acorn, and hills and rivers and all these things exist before the elves awaken, and the elves are the first children of Iluvatar, that is, mortal beings. And elves are mortal in the sense that they can die. They have limited being. They're not supernatural. Um, they're the first children of Iluvatar to wake up in Middle-earth. And so up to that point, there's just been plants and animals being created in accordance to this to the music of the Valar and the Maiar, which we talked about uh, as part of the creation of the world. So Tom's here before trees, before hills, before rivers, before elves. Well, there aren't any mortal beings before elves. There aren't even any ints before, uh, before this. So there's no forests yet. So Tom is there before Middle-earth is shaped. And I think that's supported by what he says when he says that he was here before the Dark Lord came from the outside. Now here, Tom is obviously not talking about Sauron. He has to be talking about Morgoth, the original Dark Lord. Because if he's here before the elves came west, then he's definitely not talking about Sauron as Dark Lord. He's talking about Morgoth, the first Dark Lord, the fallen Melkor, the fallen uh, Valar, who is the prime villain of the Silmarillion. 
But Morgoth comes to Middle Earth several times, but it's always from Valinor, from the, the land where the Valar lived, the Undying Lands. To say he came from the outside means from beyond the sphere of Arda, beyond the, beyond the world, meaning from the timeless realm. Tom is essentially saying he was here before Morgoth entered the universe, when, when Morgoth came from whatever is outside the universe where Eru dwells into the universe. Tom's saying he predates that, that he knew the darkness under the stars when it was fearless because Morgoth comes and he makes the dark, starlight is all there was, and Morgoth makes that frightening. He makes the night fearful, and Tom is there before that. So, Tom is very, very old. And that is an interesting claim. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Next thing about Tom, he speaks strangely. Uh, now, you probably notice this. If you try, ever try to read, if you ever try to read uh, Tom's dialogue out loud, it sounds weird. Uh, and some of it, of course, is set off into actual poetry. Uh, and that is normal poetry. That looks like normal poetry to us. It's got feet and a meter that we re and a, a rhyme scheme that we recognize. But Tom's dialogue is also poetic. It's not foot metered the way we're used to, so it doesn't, you know, have, you know, iambic, uh, iams, it's not da 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 da, -da, -da right? Uh, and if you try to read it that way, it sounds weird, but what it is, is it's stress metered. Uh, and this was the way that Anglo-Saxon poetry was done. Anglo-Saxon poetry usually has an internal rhyme in the middle of the line instead of at the end of the line, uh, and it's stress metered. In other words, uh, a line will have, say, four stresses. And uh, we can see this in Tom's uh, dialogue. If we look at um, a little bit of Tom's dialogue. So this is the first dialogue we have uh, from Tom. Uh, he sees Frodo and Sam uh, and he says, uh, Now, my little fellows, where you be a-going to, puffin' like a bellows? What's the matter here, then? Do you know who I am? I'm Tom Bombadil. Tell me what's your trouble. Tom's in a hurry now. Don't you crush my lilies. So there's this, even just trying to read it out loud, you start to get this pattern, this rhythm to it. So there's this stress meter uh, in Tom's writing. So even when Tom's just talking, he's talking in verse, sort of. Uh, and so his, his speech is metered, and that's strange. The next thing we know about Tom is he is married to the River Daughter. Uh, and that's notable because what's a River Daughter? That, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, Goldberry is another strange being. Rivers don't have daughters. There aren't river gods and, and things like that. Now what there are are Valar and Maya. Now there's a Vala uh, called um, Ulmo, and Ulmo is the lord of the seas. He's Poseidon. He's the lord of the waters. Uh, but he's also the lord of the rivers. And he, in fact, has assistant Maya, uh, lesser angelic beings, who um, are particularly in charge of particularly parts of the water. So he has Ase, who's in charge of the shores and things like that. Uh, and this seems to imply to us, if we're trying to fit this into Tolkien's legendarium, that Goldberry is probably a Maya spirit associated with the rivers. Now, that's speculation, but it fits. And it's not an, an unheard of thing for a Maya spirit to be married to another being. We see it in um, uh, the Silmarillion with Melian. Melian is a Maya who falls in love with the elf king Thingol uh, and marries, and she becomes the mother of Luthien. So Maya have the ability to choose their form or to walk unclad and invisible. Uh, and it would seem that Goldberry might be a Maya of some kind. Tom's married to her, and man, Tom has got it bad for Goldberry. Okay? He doesn't say anything except also commenting on how beautiful Goldberry is. Here's my pretty lady, he says over and over and over again. Uh, every, few wor every few lines, Tom talks about how he needs to get home because he has his house to mine and Goldberry's waiting. Uh, he, 
um, when we first meet him, he's bringing back water lilies. And we're told he does this every year at the end of summer. He goes down to, Gold, to the place where he met Goldberry and gathers water lilies for her and brings them home to uh, keep in pots that she sits in the middle of these pots of water lilies. That's how Frodo uh, meets her first. And um, they bloom by her, by her pretty feet uh, until winter is ended and new ones start to grow. And so Tom, man, Tom is in love with his wife. That's not an especially, you know, momentous thing, but it's worth noting because, again, we see that Tolkien, we remember that Tolkien is very much a romantic, and so Tom and Goldberry's sort of just carefree love is a, an important part of who they are. Tom's also a bit foresighted, uh, maybe. Things keep happening. Uh, Tom's house, Frodo has some dreams that are significant. We'll talk about them a little more later. Uh, but Tom seems to have a good idea of what's coming, even if he doesn't see the importance of it. And I'll get back to that point when I talk about Frodo's dreams and the stories that Tom tells uh, a little bit later, but just keep that in mind. The only answer that we really get for Tom is he's master. That's what Goldberry says. He says he's master. And then Frodo, said, Frodo takes this in the sense of the master of, a, of, a, of land or of, of a territory. And so he says, so then all, then all this land belongs to him. And Goldberry gets this troubled look on her face and says, no, that would be a burden. And she says, no, the, the plants, the grass, the trees, the animals, they all belong to themselves. But Tom's the master. And he's master because no one's ever caught Tom. He's fearless. He has no fear. No one's ever caught Tom leaping from over hilltops. Uh, and uh, Tom says later that his songs are stronger songs and his feet are faster. So Tom is master. He is, he is em empowered in some way. But he's not the master of everything. In fact, Tom tells Frodo and Sam uh, that he's not the master of black of riders from the black land. Okay? So he's not the master of that. Also, we're told at the Council of Elrond when it's suggested, well, why don't we send the ring to why don't we send the ring to Bombadil, since he seems impervious to it. We'll get to that here in a second. And uh, Gandalf and Elrond say that if everything else falls, Bombadil also will fall last as he was first. So if Sauron were to regain the ring, then even Bombadil would eventually go into the darkness. He would not, or, or flee Middle-earth or whatever, uh, but he would not be able to permanently resist Sauron. So that's, there are limitations on what Tom can do. Tom is also impervious to the ring. We'll come back to why I think that's important later, but this is another thing we know about Tom. He's impervious to the ring. Uh, he puts the ring on his finger and doesn't go invisible. Frodo puts the ring on and Tom can still see him. Tom is impervious to the ring. He's also unambitious. He's not interested in being master. He doesn't want mastery. He doesn't want power over the old forest. He's more like the keeper of the old forest. And he's interested in nature for its own sake. He's interested in the badgers because they're, they're hilarious. They're strange and, and, and funny creatures. He's interested in the trees and the rivers and the lily and the hills and all these things for their own sake, not for what they do for him. In fact, he manages uh, Old Man Willow, but he doesn't ever, we don't ever get the impression that he's trying to reform him, and he doesn't, certainly doesn't try to destroy Old Man Willow, even though Old Man Willow is evil. Uh, so, Tom is not interested in dominance. He has mastery because he is fearless. But that mastery extends only within his self-imposed borders. When we get to the edge of the Barrow Downs at the end of the chapter, Fog on the Barrow Downs, Tom says, Tom's land is ended here. He will not cross his borders. What does that mean? We don't know. Why does he have borders? He set them. Gandalf tells us he set them himself, and he fears nothing within them, but that's all he's interested in. He's nearly omnipotent within them, as far as we can tell. In fact, very nearly. 
when we first meet Bombadil, something very interesting happens uh, because Frodo, uh, Frodo and Sam see him coming along the path. Well, they see his hat coming along first. We'll talk about his hat here in a second. Uh, but the first thing he says is, Whoa, whoa, steady there, cried the old man, holding up one hand. And they stopped short, as if they'd been struck stiff. The first thing that Tom does is make Frodo and Sam stop moving. He holds up his hand and he says, stop. And they do. Later in his house, he tells Frodo to let him see the ring. And Frodo immediately takes out the ring and hands it to him. Tom has, an om has a level of power that no one else displays in all of Middle-earth. Gandalf doesn't do things like this. Uh, the closest Gandalf does is when he commands... Saruman to come back and then breaks his staff. That's pretty impressive, but no one else ever shows power this way. Uh, Gandalf talks about how he could make Frodo give him the ring, but only by breaking his mind. Tom gets Frodo to give him the ring without Frodo really even realizing he's doing it. And we don't know how. He just does it. And Tolkien talks about this. Um, he says that one of the things that Tom is a comment on is this idea of what if someone took a vow of poverty from power? What if you could have power, unlimited power? What if you could be omnipotent? What if, what if Tom could cross his borders? Because he doesn't say he can't. He says he will, won't. What if Tom could cross his borders and go about singing things into submission all around the world? but he won't. He chooses not to. And that's the idea that Tom is some kind of monk who is extremely powerful, but has chosen not to use his power, except in very limited circumstances. Uh, the next thing we see, an, an extension of this power, is Tom can wave off the rain. Like Tom's outside taking care of their ponies while the, when the hobbits are in his house, uh, and then he comes, they see him come around in the windows and he's waving his hands as if warding off the rain that started to fall. And then when he steps inside, nothing but his boots are wet. Another strange and mysterious power of Mr. Bombadil. Uh, and then Tom's singing is powerful. So Frodo and Sam come running up to Tom and they say, our friends are trapped in the willow. And Tom, well, Tom says, what? shouted Tom Bombadil, leaping into the air. Old man willow, not worse than he, eh? That can soon be mended. I know the tune for him, old gray willow man. I'll freeze his marrow cold if he don't behave himself. I'll sing his roots off. I'll sing a wind up and blow leaf and branch away, old man willow. And then he runs over to the willow tree. He whispers to it for a minute, um, and then he breaks off a branch from the willow and hits the willow and he says, You let them out again, old man willow, he said. What you be a-thinking of, you should not be waking. Eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep. Bombadil is talking. And the willow does it. Tom kind of half sings, half talks this command, and he does it. And then later much, much more forcefully, uh, Tom uh, rescues the hobbits from the Barrow Whites, uh, the other danger of the area around the old forest. Um, Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin are trapped in a barrow, and Tom has taught Frodo and Sa taught them all a song to sing if they get into trouble. And so Frodo sings this song, and then in a few minutes, Bombadil just shows up. Uh, no matter where he was, he just shows up, and he bursts open, he just kicks open the wall uh, and stoops his hat, stoops, uh, Tom stooped, removed his hat and came into the dark chamber and said, get out you old white, vanish in the sunlight, shrivel like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing, out into the barren lands, far beyond the mountains, come never here again, leave your barrow empty, lost and forgotten, darker than the darkness, where gates stand forever shut till the world is mended. And the Barrow White shrieks and is gone. Tom sings it out of existence? 
he destroys it with song. He sings this evil spirit that has animated the bodies of uh, dead kings out of it till he exorcises it, essentially, uh, with song. So we have some peculiar facts about Tom. And the last one is Tom's outfit is ridiculous. In fact, Tom's hat is the very first thing uh, that we see coming around the bend, is that Frodo and Sam are running along, uh, trying to find help for Merry and Pippin, uh, and then um, there's an answer uh, of song, and then Frodo and Sam stood as if enchanted. The wind puffed out like the, like the willow, something like the moms walked into the room and so the willow just freezes. Uh, the leaves hung silent on stiff branches. There was another burst of song, and suddenly, hopping and dancing along the path, there appeared above the reeds an old battered hat and it, with a tall crown and a long blue feather stuck in the band. So Tom wears bright colors, but kind of old. He's shabby, but extravagant all at the same time. Uh, and he takes treasure from the Barrow, Barrow Whites uh, to take back to Goldberry. Uh, he comments that she who wore it once was fair, and now Goldberry will wear it, and we will remember her. Uh, so he has all of these just extravagant outfits, but it's all kind of shabby. He's just wearing a coat and big boot, gigantic boots. Uh, he's got a big beard, giant hat with a bright blue feather. So Tom's outfits are shabby, but glorious, magnificent. Okay, so taking these facts, there are a bunch of theories that people have come up with as to what Bombadil is. What is Bombadil's place in Middle-earth? Uh, and I'll defend doing this here in a minute. It's wild speculation, but I'm going to explain why it's worth, why it's okay to do, why it fits very much into Tolkien's world to do this kind of speculation. So one is the idea that Tom is a rogue Maya spirit, that Tom is a Maya who came into Middle-earth uh, and has just stayed here. And these exist. Uh, as we said, Melian stays in Mary's um, uh, thingle. Um, but this doesn't really fit all the things Tom says about himself. He claims to be the first thing in Middle-earth, and that doesn't fit the Maya. The Maya come with the Valar and in service to the Valar. Uh, so that fits Goldberry better than Tom. Next, uh, some people have theorized that Tom is, in fact, an embodiment of Eru, the, the, the god of Middle-earth. Um, but that doesn't fit. And the reason that doesn't fit is that we're told that Tom would not ultimately be able to resist Sauron. And Eru is not lesser than Sauron. So Tom can't be Eru because he would eventually fall, fall to Sauron. So that doesn't work. Uh, another suggestion is that um, he is one of these spirits drawn down by Yavanna to protect forests. Uh, in, in essence, he's one with the Ents. He is a tree herder, and that kind of fits. He does seem to just be going around tending the old forest. And we are told that the old forest, in Tom's stories, that the old forest is the last survivor of, a, of an ancient primeval forest. And if that's true, uh, and Tom is its tender, then that would also explain Tom's limited borders, as the Tom's borders are that portion of this once great forest that still exists and Tom's job is to tend it, to go around and make sure that things are safe. And this kind of fits when he says, he tells Frodo uh, the reason he won't come with them is that he has things to do, his singing and his mending and his making and that sort of thing. And so maybe, maybe that's what Tom is. Maybe he's just the, sh the shepherd of the old forest in the same way that Treebeard is the shepherd of Fangorn. So that's a possibility. Uh, it doesn't fit Tom's claim to be eldest, but maybe he's not counting the Valar. And it would sync up Tom's claim and Treebeard's claim, because Treebeard claims that he is the oldest living thing. Uh, although Gandalf said, or uh, <laughs> Gandalf, uh, Tolkien, in a letter, says that Treebeard's claim can be considered that Treebeard, while very, very knowledgeable, does not know everything and probably doesn't know about Bombadil. So it's possible that Tom is also a tree herder who's just not tree-shaped. 
Uh, another theory is the, that Tom is an embodiment of the spirit of Arda, of the earth itself. Uh, Elrond says that, um, does such power exist in Bombadil to resist Sauron? No, unless such power is in the earth itself. Uh, and implying that Tom's power derives directly from the earth. And so maybe Tom is some kind of earth spirit. Uh, that could work. It's just a little odd because we don't have any other kind of spirits like that who show up anywhere or are mentioned anywhere. But it is possible that that's one. Uh, a really meta interpretation of this is that Tom is the reader himself. Because just like Tom, you and I are unaffected by the ring. We can make things stop and start by closing the book. See? Yeah. Um, that's cute and it works in a sense you can make it work but Tolkien's just not that postmodern I think to put an embodiment of the reader in his book it's a neat idea and it kind of works in logic to an extent but I, it's, just, it's not a very Tolkienish thing to do so what do I think Bombadil is my personal theory for what Tom Bombadil is is that Tom is the music of creation given shape Okay, so here's why I think that. We have other beings that came into Arda when the music was being made. The first thing we're told is that before Arda is actually shaped, that the music goes out into the void. We're told this in the beginning of the Silmarillion in the, in the Ainulindala. That the music goes out into the void, and it was not void. So the music goes out from Eru and the other, from Eru and the Valar and the Maya. The music goes out and the void is not void anymore. Creation happens before the Valar descend into the world and, um, and, and shape it into the world. So there's something there before even the shaping of Middle-earth happens. We also have another creature that's kind of like that, but in the opposite way. We have Ungoliant. Ungoliant is a horrible spider-like creature, but we're told in the Silmarillion that she came in from the void. Maybe she's a Maya spirit corrupted by Sauron, or by Morgoth, but at the same time, she is kind of Morgoth's equal in power, because Morgoth has empowered her, and that's part of why, but once he's done so, she is a, a danger to him. When she, she helps him steal the Silmarils, these magical jewels made by Feanor, and darken Valinor by destroying the trees that give light. Uh, and then when Morgoth tries to withhold the jewels from her, he gives her a bunch of the treasure he found and she destroys it, but she wants all of it because her hunger is in, in, insatiable. And when he refuses, she attacks him. Like she casts her web, her darkness around him. And Morgoth cries out in terror and his cry is heard by Balrogs who come and they drive Ungoliant away and rescue, rescue Morgoth. So Ungoliant is more powerful than just a Maya uh, that we've seen. So she might be something else. She might be the void given shape, the nothingness, the emptiness that is evil given shape through Morgoth's discord. Uh, as the music is being made, Morgoth starts singing his own tune and it creates discord in the music of the Valar and the Maya uh, that's doing creation. And so perhaps Ungoliant is created by this discord. And that would make Tom the anti-Ungoliant because Ungoliant is insatiable and greedy and devours and is desperate for power and dominance and destroys beauty. And Tom has forsworn all that. He could perhaps be master of everything, but he's chosen to be master of a very limited, tiny little corner of the world where he's just fearless. He's not dominant. He doesn't go around telling the badgers and the fisher, fish and the trees what to do. He's just master. He's fearless. None has ever caught old Tom. So maybe Tom is the anti-Ungoliant. He's something created by the music itself before anyone started shaping anything. This also works if we think about the character of the Old Forest. Now, the Old Forest, in the Old Forest, trees still move around. And one interpretation of that is that they are hjorns, which are sort of uh, half-awake trees or half-asleep ends. And that 
Old Man Willow is thus an int that's gone bad. Uh, but there is another possibility. Um, if we look at the Chronicles of Narnia, an interesting thing we see in The Magician's Nephew is that Narnia is also created by music, uh, and we see that it's Aslan singing the world into being, and uh, Jadis, the white, who, who eventually becomes the White Witch, is terrified of Aslan, and she grabs a... She's got a bar from a lamppost that she tore off in England before they all got sucked into Narnia, and she throws it at Aslan, and it hits him, and, ignore, and he ignores it, and it flies off, and it sticks in the ground, and she runs away. Well, the music is so powerful that everything grows really fast, including that the lamp, the tree grows into a lamppost. And what Aslan explains is that the echo of his song is still heavy on the earth, and so uh, things are much more alive uh, than they will be soon as the echo dies away. Maybe the old forest is this place where the echoes of the music have never died away, and Tom is the embodiment of that and the trees move because they're just a little more awake. It's not that they're any particular type of tree or horn or int or whatever. Maybe they're just a little more awake. Now, maybe not, uh, but it's an interesting thought. Next, the power of song. Tom's songs are immensely powerful. In fact, we're so told that in his house, while Frodo and the others are eating and drinking, they find themselves singing as if it was easier than speech. So Tom's music is infectious. And in his house, it's easier to sing than speak. Now, unless you live in a Broadway musical, that's not true anywhere else. Uh, but in Tom Bombadil's house, it is. It's just easier to, talk, to sing than to speak. So that's my personal theory. Uh, this is my idea is that, and I, you know, I'm probably not the only person who's come to this conclusion, but my idea is that Bombadil was created before the world was shaped by the music of the immortals, by the music of creation. So that's who I think Bombadil is. But what does he do for the story? Well, a few things. Um, and there's Argos. Uh, he does a few things for the story. One is that if we look at a fairy tale structure, if you look at um, you know, story things, theories like Joseph Campbell's monomyth, fairy tales have these structures of if you move out of your well-known, known world, your understood world, uh, and Tolkien tells us that a fairy story is moving from that world into the unknown, into the into the into fairy, the perilous realm. The old forest is a threshold into that. It's the first big adventure. We, now, adventure has already found the hobbits by this point, and that they've the riders have come upon them several times. But moving into the old forest is when they finally leave the Shire behind. They leave the settled country, and they're moving into a threshold. And thresholds always have guardians, and guardians usually test, but also often give wisdom to the to the traveler and tom is this guardian uh, in narrative terms uh, he's the guardian over the edge of the wild who gives them some wisdom and also shows them the danger of the world the barrow whites are a really specific kind of evil uh, in that they are nothing that has animated something uh, and that's that's significant here um, we also see that in frodo's house frodo gains some interesting information. Uh, on the one hand, Tom is able to tell him really the history of everything, but also uh, Frodo has an interesting dream. Frodo has a dream in the house of Tom Bombadil, uh, the, the second night that he is, uh, that he's in Tom's house. Uh, and, and in Tom's house, uh, Frodo's um, dream is that he's he's hearing music. He's standing in rain and he's hearing music. Um, <clears throat> and all of a sudden the rain all turns to silvered glass. Uh, and then he's looking out over a far green country under a swift sunrise. This is exactly the same music Music. This is exactly the same language that's used when Frodo is going to the Undying Lands at the end of the, at the very end of the book. Uh, is that this very language? In fact, it even says, "As in the dream in the House of Bombadil." So Frodo has a premonition of what's going to happen to him. And even before that, he has a dream of Gandalf imprisoned in Orthanc uh, at Sauron's tower. So 
Frodo sees things that are far off and that have already happened, and then he sees something that is far off and hasn't happened yet. He has these foreshadowings and after-coming dreams of things that are going on in the world. Uh, and those, this foreshadowing is important because this is the very beginning of Frodo's adventure, and already he's dreaming about the end of Frodo's adventure, and we're told that the sea has often troubled his dreams. And then the next thing is that after the adventure with the Barrowite, they're going along and Tom is telling them the story of the lands around them. And he tells them about these kings that had come and gone uh, and faded into the grass, and now there were only these grim descendants. And Frodo sees in his mind, all the hobbits do, they see in their minds this image of grim men walking th along the world down through the ages, and last came one with a star on his brow. Now this is this is a description of Aragorn, who they are right about to meet, although as Strider, and they're not going to know who he is. But this is a description of Aragorn, uh, wearing the star of Elendil. This is the crown of the North Kingdom. It's a, it's a jewel on a little silver fillet uh, worn on the head. And so we're so Bombadil knows, or Bombadil's story, even if Bombadil doesn't know, tells Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin about their next guide, their next guardian, who is going to sort of broaden the story um, in a very interesting way. And then lastly, and I think most the most important thing that happens with Bombadil is this, and this comes back to this idea of this uh, vow of poverty from power, is Bombadil in the ring. Bombadil has, the po ring has no power over Bombadil. It's not that he has power over the ring, but the ring has no power over him because Bombadil is unambitious. He doesn't desire power. There's nothing for the, for the ring to work on in Bombadil because he's entirely content in who he is and what he has. He is himself. He is Tom Bombadil. He is the master. And the ring has no power over him. And this tells us something very important about the ring. The ring is the great challenge of Frodo's day. But it's not the first great crisis to come to Middle-earth. There have been Dark Lords before Sauron. There was Morgoth. There were the Silmarils. There was the Oath of Feanor and the Wars of the Jewels and the downfall of Numenor and the Dark Ages when Sauron was, a, was master of all Middle-earth. There have been crises before. The Ring is not the first. And it will not be the last. In fact, Tolkien started work on a fourth book, a sequel to Lord of the Rings, about a new Dark Lord. It's called The Return of the Shadow, or the, uh, the New Shadow. About a new Dark Lord arising somewhere in the East. The ring is not the last. And there are things which will exist and endure and are important beyond the scope of our immediate crisis. That thing that's happening right now in our lives, in our world, the, the great political crisis or military crisis or whatever crisis of our day, seems to us life and death, seems to us the thing for which all will judge us and that we must solve it or the whole world will be doomed. But just like the star that Sam sees in Mordor that reminds him that there are things, that the shadow is a passing thing. It's a small thing in the grand scheme of the, of the universe, that there are things beyond it which it can't touch. There are things beyond the ring. There are things the ring can't touch. This is the first hint of that truth that Sam will come to fully understand in Mordor, that whatever we think is massive, and think about this for Tolkien to write this. Tolkien lives through World War II, the Depression, World War I. Tolkien lives through one of the most crisis-laden periods in history. And here is Tolkien writing that, yes, the ring, the great doom of our time, as Elrond calls it, is a huge deal. And it is up to Frodo and the others to decide what to do with it, just as it is up to us to decide what to do with the time we're given. But it's good to remember that there are things beyond us there are things beyond our crisis and the crises of our children and grandchildren. There are things that have been here forever and things that will be here long after us that aren't touched by the thing that we believe is life or death for the whole world. And that's a good perspective for us to remember. 
anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I intend to make some more about other sort of mysterious things and um, come back and talk about it. I didn't really get around to talking about the deliberate mystery aspect, and I think I'll come back to around, around to that in its own video because I'm just sort of out of time here and uh, needs more than just a, a random comment at the end. So I'll come back around to that idea in another, another video because there are others in Middle Earth, and it's important to the way that Tolkien created Middle Earth. So I'll come around to that in a different video. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section. Uh, if you have suggestions on other Middle Earth lore videos you'd like to see, uh, please let me know. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook at The Geek Pantheon. You can email us at thegeekpantheon at gmail.com and find us on all other social media at The Geek Pantheon. If you like what we do and would like to see it done more or better, uh, consider joining our Patreon community over on Patreon uh, at The Geek Pantheon. Uh, patrons get access to our Patreon Discord server uh, where you get all sorts of crazy co uh, crazy conversations and can interact with the hosts of our various shows and the players in our in our podcast games uh, directly uh, and help shape what we do. So um, thank you again for watching. Uh, I'm your host, Philip. This has been the Geek Pantheon. See you later.